Good evening, everyone. My name is Michelle Galazuski. I'm a Partner Relations Director with Eversight. And on behalf of everyone at Eversight, I would like to thank you for joining tonight's program, Clinical Management of HSV Keratitis and Preventing Infection at Tissue Procurement. In an effort to eliminate all background noise, all participants will be muted throughout the duration of the webinar. If you would like to ask a question, you can do so by typing your question into the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen. And then we will address all questions at the end of the webinar. At this time, I would like to introduce our speakers for this evening. Dr. Mohamed Desjerdi is an ophthalmologist and assistant professor at Rutgers New Jersey Medical School with specialty training in cornea, external disease, and refractive surgery. Dr. Desjerdi earned his medical degree from Tehran University of Medical Sciences and completed an ophthalmology residency at Kansas University Medical Center. He finished a clinical fellowship in cornea and external diseases at Michigan Medicine's Kellogg Eye Center and he also completed a research fellowship at Harvard's Sheppens Eye Research Institute at Mass Eye and Ear. As Director of Research at Eversight, Ankar Savant is responsible for all research and development activities, in addition to leading the Eversight Center for Vision and Eye Banking Research located in Cleveland. Dr. Savant received a doctorate in biomedical sciences and master's in biotechnology from Texas A&M University. He completed a postdoctoral fellowship at the Cleveland Clinic Cole Eye Institute and was named an Emerging Vision Scientist by the National Alliance for Eye and Vision Research. Ankar was featured just last week in Newsweek for his ongoing research on the effects of COVID-19 on donor tissue. Dr. Desjardy, you can go ahead and begin. Uh, thank you, Michelle. And uh, um, before I start, I would like to uh, Thank Eversight for inviting me to have this presentation tonight. So I'm gonna talk about HSV keratitis and my main focus tonight uh, would be on uh, treatment and prevention. And uh, I have no financial interest to disclose. Um, so herpes viruses in general, uh, they are uh, uh, double-stranded uh, DNA viruses and they have a viral envelope uh, lipid bilayer. The point is here that this um, uh, herpes viruses, because of this envelope uh, lipid bilayer, they are not able to uh, maintain their infectivity uh, in the environment, and they quickly uh, basically deactivate it. And uh, it's very hard to transmit um, iatrogenically through the um, medical instrument, and it, we can easily um, clean the instrument in terms of the HSV with the alcohol. And uh, we have eight uh, herpes, uh, human herpes uh, viruses. Uh, six of them affect, uh, human, uh, affect human eye, and from those uh, six, herpes simplex uh, type one and two and varicella zoster virus are the most two important viruses that affecting the eye. And um, <clears throat> interesting point here is that all herpes viruses established as a form of latency in, the, um, in their host. For example, HSV type one and two and VZV established latent infection, um, <clears throat> basically in dorsal ganglia such as trigeminal ganglion and Epstein-Barr virus uh, has a latency in B lymphocytes. And um, let me start, uh, and my main talk today is going to be on herpes simplex virus keratitis. And uh, I, would, uh, I will start with epidemiology. Um, uh, HSV is endemic throughout the world. Um, humans are the only known natural resources, uh, reservoir for this uh, virus. And uh, 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 nearly, uh, uh, we can say 100%, or better, we can say more than 90% of people above age 60, they are seropositive for this virus. And a, a study uh, um, in the cadaver shows that uh, 60 and above, they have this virus in the trigeminal ganglia. And about one third of the world population suffer a form of recurrent infection. 
Uh, I'm not talking about the ocular infection, any form of uh, HSV infection. And um, in, uh, HSV mainly transmitted through the direct contact with the infected secretion like saliva or tears. And um, seroconversion mainly um, affected by degree of exposure. And that depends on the crowding, poor hygiene, and age. For example, in kids, uh, less than uh, five year old, uh, there is a study that in low social e economy group kids before age 40, be before age five, they are about 40% uh, seropositive compared to 20% in middle class. Uh, so <clears throat> HSV keratitis is the leading infectious cause of corneal blindness among developed nations. And um, it estimated that about um, basically five to 15 cases per 100,000 population per year, we have new cases. And in terms of the recurrence, about 30% we have um, a recurrence within 12 months. It estimated globally about a million new cases each year, and about nine million recurrent episodes of ocular HSV each year. So it's a quite um, a burden because all these uh, patients need to be seen by an ophthalmologist, and also loss of productivity and time that these patients um, spend out of the work. And, uh, and uh, actually, you know, the effect on the vision is, 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 might be significant. And in terms of recurrence, uh, I just want to bring this to uh, your attention that we uh, may always we talk about the recurrence, but we have different form of recurrence. Let me, um, uh, to, you know, um, to explain this, uh, why I'm t uh, talking about uh, different recurrences. Uh, let me bring this example. If we have an epithelial keratitis and subsequently we got a, a recurrence, epithelium to epithelium keratitis is about 15% chance. But non-epithelial HSV ocular disease to epithelial is about 12%. So it's almost the same. But look at the stromal keratitis. The stromal to stromal recurrence is about 28%. While Non-stromal HSV ocular infection to a stromal is about 3%. And this is something that we need to keep in mind when we wanted to initiate um, uh, prevention for this, uh, preventive treatment for these patients. And the other thing about the recurrence, the number of recurrence is strongly associated with the number of past episodes. So for that reason, we can say a history of HSV stromal keratitis, I mean, uh, emphasize stromal keratitis, and a high number of previous episodes increases the risk of future recurrences. So that's a very important point. And the other thing, shorter interval between uh, attacks also associated with the shorter in interval between the future attacks. And in terms of the clinical manifestation, I don't want to go to the details of the clinical manifestation of different forms of HSV keratitis. My main point here is that HSV keratitis affecting different corneal layers has functionally distinct mechanism of pathogenesis. And for that reason, we're going to target our treatment differently. So if we look at the classification of HS, uh, HSV keratitis, so it affects all layers of the cornea. If it's... Uh, in epithelium, we may have dendritic or geographic um, epithelial keratitis. Here, we have live and direct virus invasion. So that's something that I just want to bring to your attention because when we start the treatment, this is going to be helpful. Also, we have a stromal keratitis. We have two types of a stromal keratitis. A stromal keratitis without alteration, uh, mostly we uh, refer to that as interstitial keratitis and HSV keratitis with ulceration or necrotizing keratitis. In HSV stromal keratitis without ulceration, main mechanism is the immune mechanism. 
While in stromal keratitis with alteration, we have both. We have live viruses and we have immune mechanisms also involved. In endothelial uh, keratitis, the main mechanism, immune mechanism, although we may have live viruses as well. And this classification can help to uh, strategize our treatment. In terms of the modifiers, um, uh, there are different modifiers that, uh, you know, um, it affects the severity and uh, the clinical presentation of the disease. Uh, so we may consider HSV virulence. Although in, in uh, animal studies, it shows that different strains of HSV can have different, um, uh, uh, basically, um, uh, virulence, but in the human, it, uh, no, so far, no study shows that different strains have different um, infectivity. But in terms of the uh, host, we have two different um, factors, general susceptibility of the host and local susceptibility of the host. Then I'm going to talk about this. In regard to general susceptibility of the host, uh, basically any condition that depresses the cell-mediated immunity may increase the risk of HSV disease, like organ transplant recipient, diabetes mellitus. It's very obvious in these cases we have higher risk uh, for HSV keratitis and recurrence of this infection. Patient with measles, uh, the area that is still measles is uh, is uh, prevalent uh, because of the uh, you know um, def uh, while the disease is active, we have a uh, cell-mediated immunity, uh, basically, um, uh, that um, is not functioning well, we may have an increased risk of HSV keratitis. In HIV, although the studies didn't show that the, uh, uh, the new, the basically, incidence of the HSV is not higher in HIV uh, patients, but the recurrence rate is much higher in patients with HIV infection than non-HIV patients. And in terms of the, uh, also we may have altered immune system. And in terms of that, uh, we um, can look into uh, children and patients with atopic disease. Um, in children, we know that we have uh, more bilateral disease. In adults, we rarely see as a bilateral disease. Uh, in children, the other um, things we may see epithelial and stromal keratitis at the same time. This is also is very rare in adults. Uh, we have higher recurrence rate in the first year in kids and commonly misdiagnosed because the clinical uh, presentation might be uh, not uh, that much classic. And the other thing, because we have a very severe inflammatory response in kids, they develop significant scarring and loss of vision. And uh, so for that reason, kids need more attention when they get HSV keratitis. And in terms of the atopia, atopic patients, uh, you know, we uh, define the atopia as a personal or family history of asthma or uh, other form of atopic um, uh, skin eczema. And um, we know that in uh, uh, atopic uh, patients, uh, Th2 cell immunity is more active than Th1, so the balance tilts it more towards Th2, uh, which leads to synthesis of IgE antibody and production of uh, eosinophil. And for that reason, Th1 is not as active as it should be. And again, we may have more uh, cases of HSV. And the other thing with um, atopic patients, uh, the risk of uh, getting HSV is about two to five times higher than non-atopic uh, patients. And we have more severe form of HSV keratitis. We have more bilateral diseases. And also the other interesting thing that they, uh, uh, the therapeutic response to topical antiviral is significantly less than oral agents. And that also is a point that when we wanted to initiate treatment for this patient, we need to uh, take it into consideration that the topical is not as effective as oral in these cases. And also we have some immune stressors that um, uh, anecdotally we think that may initiate a, uh, a recurrence 
Although head the study uh, showed none of these can uh, be a factor in a recurrence. Um, and in terms of local susceptibility, we talk about, we can consider topical medications and surgery that we do in, um, uh, in, 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 uh, eyes, in eye or around the eye. So in terms of the topical medica medication, for example, for segalandin analogs like latinoprost, there are some reports that um, after initiation of the latinoprost, the um, uh, patient gets epithelial keratitis. There are case reports. Still, we don't know how this is uh, the importance of this. But uh, common sense says that if we know that the patient has a uh, history of recurrence, uh, we should avoid uh, the prostaglandin. And in terms of the corticosteroids, it's very obvious the corticosteroids, either uh, type, topical, intravitreal, or systemic, can uh, increase the risk of recurrence. And also, in terms of the angiogenesis uh, inhibitor, uh, VEGF inhibitor, um, like uh, bevacizumab or uh, ranocizumab, there are cases, uh, reports of bevacizumab of intravitreal injection that cause um, epithelial, um, um, uh, recurrence of epithelial keratitis. Also, we use this medication actually for the treatment of uh, neovascularization associated with HSV keratitis. But still, there are some reports. We don't know what's the importance of this. And in terms of um, trauma and uh, surgery, the contact lens where um, head the study didn't show any significant uh, correlation. But in terms of laser surgery, particularly LASIK and uh, laser refractive surgery like PRK or PTK, we may have a recurrence either epithelial or uh, stromal, particularly with the PTK or PRK, we may have more epithelial uh, early in the after the surgery. With the LASIK, we may have more stromal recurrence, and later two or three weeks after the surgery. Also, it was reported as after YAC uh, PI or YAC capsulotomy, ALT, and also it was reported after the cataract surgery and uh, penetrating uh, or lamellar keratoplasty. Also, with the surgery, we don't know if it's the um, uh, direct uh, association with the local trauma associated with the laser or surgery, or is because of the steroid that we use. But uh, I want to a little bit focus on uh, keratoplasty. Um, uh, we have two main reasons for graft failure after keratoplasty in patients with hepatic eye disease. Uh, one is viral reactivation and the other one is simple graft rejection. And most of the time, it's, uh, and some of the time, it's very difficult to differentiate these two. And for this reason, um, patients with history of ocular HSV have a higher instance of allograft rejection. And uh, look at the numbers and the recurrence rate of HSV keratitis after PKP in patients without oral antiviral prophylaxis was reported about 30% at four months uh, 40 to 45 percent in one year, and almost 50 percent at two years. So it's very significant. And um, uh, but patient that had uh, unprophylactic treatment with acyclovir, they showed uh, fewer recurrences. I was going to give you some numbers again. If the uh, patient uh, with prior history of uh, HSV keratitis undergoes uh, uh, either uh, full thickness or glamellar keratoplasty. If we start the treatment for three weeks after the, and continue only for three weeks, the risk of recurrence is about 30%. If we continue for three months after the surgery the rate is about 18%. But if we continue up to six months, the rate drops to 6%. And if we continue one year, the rate drops to 0 to 5%. And that shows the importance of the prophylactic treatment in this uh, patient. And in terms of the diagnosis, uh, the main point here that, um, you know, the main um, diag way of diagnosis of HSV keratitis is, is almost always for us is uh, solely uh, on clinical appearance of the cornea. Although we can detect the uh, uh, virus either through culture, PCR, or other tests, but testing most of the time is uh, time-consuming, expensive, and the results come sometimes very late, and it might not be helpful to uh, you know and uh, to help us with the treatment. 
Um, so mainly our diagnosis is clinical. And in terms of the treatment, so we have 11 antiviral agents that have, uh, they have proven efficacy against HSV, but only five of them, two topical, trifluoridine and ganslycovid, and three systemic, uh, we can use them in the United States as a treatment uh, for HSV keratitis. And uh, I would like to divide the, 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 the treatment in three categories. Uh, therapeutic low dose, that's the, uh, basically the uh, conventional dose, a uh, cyclovir 400 milligrams five times a day that we usually use for the treatment of HSV keratitis. And we have the therapeutic high dose, a cyclovir 800 milligrams five times a day that we usually use it for herpes zoster. And also we have a prophylactic dose of acyclovir 400 milligram two times a day. And also we can have a equivalent doses of uh, valacyclovir or fambia. Um, but let me, uh, um, uh, for the treatment, I'm gonna go uh, with uh, uh, either, um, with each category of the keratitis. For epithelial keratitis, uh, two uh, points that I, I would like to make, uh, oral antiviral agents are as effective as topical antiviral. Although, uh, FDA-approved medicine is gancyclovir and trifluoridine. None of the systemic treatments, antiviral, uh, are approved by uh, FDA for treatment of HSV keratitis. So the approved treatment is gancyclovir and trifluoridine. But oral antiviral the studies uh, show that is as effective as topical. And the other thing, there is no evidence that simultaneous use of two antiviral agents, whether topical or oral, accelerates healing of HSV epithelial keratitis. And in terms of how we can choose the treatment, so for epithelial keratitis, if we have a dendritic form, because it's the earlier stage and we think the uh, viral load is low, we can go with the therapeutic low dose. Why? Because we have live virus here and the, low, the dose of the virus is low. So we can go either with the, uh, a cyclovir 400 milligram three to five times a day for, or equivalent of valacyclovir 500 milligram twice a day or famcyclovir 250 twice a day for seven to 10 days. Or we can go with the topical uh, trifluoridine one drop nine times a day for seven days. And after that, we go to five times a day and we shouldn't continue beyond three weeks because of significant ocular to surface toxicity. And the better option is gun cyclovir that we can use five times a day um, uh, till the, uh, the epithelium gets healed and then we decrease it to three times and continue for seven days. But if we have a epithelial keratitis, geographic form, because this is, this is a later stage, probably we have more virus and the virus load is higher. Some people, they suggest that we need to go with therapeutic dose. So we have live virus and we need to go with the high dose. And they suggest the five, 800 uh, milligram of acyclovir uh, five times a day and with the longer duration, two to three weeks or equivalent dose of uh, other uh, antivirals, oral antivirals. Also, the topical, again, the same as uh, we, uh, we already said about uh, dendritic. And in terms of the stromal keratitis, as we know here, immune mechanism is the, the main mechanism. So uh, the main treatment is gonna be a steroid. So we're gonna use the therapeutic dose of topical corticosteroids. I mean by therapeutic dose, uh, presence on 1% or equivalent of that, six to eight times daily that we tapered over 10 weeks. At least we need to use, use it for 10 weeks. Plus prophylactic dose of uh, antivirals because we don't have the uh, live virus here. So we can use the outside to 400 milligrams twice daily or equivalent of other. And here we, with the prednisone, as long as the patient is under prednisone, we need to continue with the prophylactic dose of uh, antiviral. And the pr prednisone, we gradually and slowly decrease the frequency and the dosage. And the lower we go with the dose and frequency, we need to increase the interval to find the, you know, the safe 
uh, final dose for that patient. And if we have, oh, this is, I'm sorry, I, this is the stromal keratitis without ulceration. But if we have a stromal keratitis with ulceration, here we have live virus as well as immune mechanism. So here we go with a limited dose of topical corticosteroids plus therapeutic dose of high dose of antiviral because the, we have low, um, basically the virus load is higher here. So we go with the uh, prednisone 1% twice daily plus acyclovir 800 milligram three to five times daily for seven to 10 days. And um, as long as the patient is in the, uh, and, and then after seven to 10 days, we can go to the prophylactic dose. And as long as the patient on prednisone, we can continue with the prophylactic dose. And in terms of the uh, uh, treatment, basically, the story is basically how the patient clinically responds to it. There is no real study on um, uh, stromal keratitis with ulceration for how long we need to continue with this. And in terms of the endothelial keratitis, here we have main mechanism is immune mechanism, although we may have some live viruses. So here we go with the therapeutic dose of topical corticosteroids as well as therapeutic dose of oral antiviral, although we can go with the low dose. So prednisone, again, 1%, uh, 6 to 8 times daily, plus um, acyclovir, 400 milligrams, 3 to 5 times daily. And we can continue with the 7 to 10 days. And as long as the patient is, uh, and then after seven to 10 days, actually, we can go to the prophylactic dose of the um, uh, antiviral. And as long as the patient on the steroid, we need to continue with the antiviral prophylactic dose. And in terms of the prevention, uh, HIDS study has uh, five um, uh, different trials. Uh, I'm talking about the fifth trial that is look at the prevention. Uh, and the question was, does acyclovir, uh, oral acyclovir uh, prophylaxis minimize HSV recurrence? And they recruited uh, 700 patients and they gave them 400 milligrams twice a day for 12 months and they followed them for 18 months afterward. And it showed that it decreased uh, the risk of recurrence of stromal keratitis by 50%. So for that reason, long-term prophylaxis recommended for patients with recurrent HSV keratitis. So what else do we need to know about the antiviral prophylaxis? The majority of morbidity we know that associated with the ocular HSV is due to the HSV stromal keratitis. So long-term, at least one year or more, low-dose on oral antiviral is recommended for patients with history of recurrent HSV stromal keratitis. And the other uh, potential indication, if we have multiple recurrence of any type of HSV keratitis, if we have a recurrent inflammation with a scar and neovascularization approaching visual axis, if we have more than one episode of HSV keratitis with ulceration, because here we have a strong inflammatory response and it ended up with a neovascularization lipid deposition. And uh, post keratoplasty uh, in patients with uh, HSV related scarring or any other um, uh, ocular surgery in patients with prior. Uh, uh, history of HSV, and in patients with history of ocular HSV during immunosuppressive treatment. And prophylactic treatment, as I mentioned, is uh, acyclovir is the classic, it's 400 milligrams twice a day, uh, at least for one year, or equivalent dose of valacyclovir, 500 milligrams once a day, or famcyclovir, 250 twice a day. And also, the duration, we don't know, nobody really knows, but at least should be one year. Some people, they use this indefinitely. And in terms of, again, um, oral, uh, one thing about the uh, prophylaxis, oral antiviral prophylaxis is more effective than topical. We shouldn't use the topical as a prophylaxis. Um, other oral antiviral, because the classic one is acyclovir, but studies show that the um, violent cyclovir also is as effective as acyclovir. And um, uh, recurrence actually is more likely in patients that they use lower doses than 800 milligram daily. So if you are keeping a patient on prophylaxis dose, at least it's, they should be on 800 milligram daily. And in terms of the patient that they have ocular surgery, sometimes we need to go much higher for prophylaxis. 
actually, uh, it's a study showed that the recurrent HSV keratitis following ocular surgery, uh, those that on the higher doses, more than uh, three, um, uh, 400 milligram TID um, acyclovir, they experienced significantly lower recurrence than the patient that they use less than 1,000 milligram a day. So for that reason, if we are uh, doing PKP, I would suggest oral acyclovir in doses of 800 milligram three times a day. And some people, they suggested to continue for four months uh, initially, and we can taper it to 400 milligram twice a day, and we can keep it at least for one year. And some people, they say, as long as they are on topical steroids, we should continue with the, uh, this prophylaxis. And my uh, talk, the majority of this uh, slide and uh, the, the, uh, um, the points that I brought, uh, mainly I uh, brought it from this article, the uh, treatment guide, um, a treatment guideline by James Chodosh that's published by American Academy of Ophthalmology in 2014. And thank you for your attention. If you have any question at the end of this, I will be more than happy to, uh, if I can, I answer them. Thank you. All right. Um, good evening, everybody. I hope uh, you can see my slides okay and hear me okay. Uh, my name is Omkar Savan. I'm Director for Research and Innovation at Eversight. And today I'm going to talk about our study on uh, assessing effect of second uh, beta dyne exposure on corneal toxicity and decreasing uh, donor tissue fungal bio burden and uh, its consequence sequential impact on our clinical outcomes. Uh, so this study has been possible because of uh, a tremendous collaboration between different teams within Eversight and uh, our collaboration with Dr. Ali Jalilian at uh, Department of Ophthalmology at UIC Chicago. Uh, we like to start all of our presentation with our mission statement. So we restore sight and prevent blindness through the healing power of donation, transplantation, and research. So over the last 10 to 15 years, uh, especially iBank of Association of America has reported uh, increasing trend in post-operative fungal infection of after corneal transplantation. Uh, one of the reason could be increase in endothelial keratoplasty procedures, uh, but there has been increasing trend. Uh, work done by uh, CPTS, Corneal Preservation Time Study Group, showed that uh, overall rate of positive uh, rim fungal culture is somewhere around 1.9%. And out of those 1.9% cases, 6.7% of those cases uh, go on developing post-operative uh, infection. Similar, uh, similar to this, there has been uh, other reports uh, that has been published over the last two decades showing that post-operative uh, positive fungal culture rate is somewhere between uh, 1% to 2%. So to address this issue, uh, really innovative work that was started by Georgia iBank uh, a couple of years ago, uh, identifying if we could use uh, double beta dyne soak procedure to reduce the fungal bio burden. Uh, and this work has been published in Cornea Journal uh, in last year. Their study showed that uh, if we increase the beta dyne soak time, it significantly reduces positive fungal and bacterial cultures. Uh, it caused uh, no incidences of clinical fungal infection has been seen and no change in primary graft failure rate was observed because of increasing the beta dyne exposure. However, there is a still gap in our knowledge about understanding how uh, if double beta dyne soak procedure is actually causing any epithelial or overall corneal toxicity. Some of our surgeons uh, had raised concern about increasing this uh, beta dyne exposure. And their concern is valid because there are a couple of studies done in different animal models, especially using a rabbit, uh, rabbit model that has shown that if you inject uh, betadine or povidone iodide uh, directly into the anterior chamber at the concentration of 0.25 to 10%, it can cause endothelial uh, toxicity. 
Therefore, our purpose uh, for this study was to determine the effect of uh, double betadine soak procedure on corneal toxicity at the level of epithelial and endothelial toxicity. Also assess the function of uh, overall corneal health uh, as a measure of corneal thickness during the corneal uh, during the donor storage preparation, uh, and also evaluate the epithelial outcomes from our surgical procedure. Uh, so beginning from November 1st, 2019, Eversight did start uh, double beta dyne soak procedure. So I'll present some of the data that highlights the epithelial toxicity. And then second purpose was to really uh, provide quantitative data on post uh, positive rim culture and post-operative infection after implementing this protocol. Uh, so we undertook this research study where uh, we procured donor uh, tissues with an uh, with single beta dyne soak procedure and then double beta dyne soak procedure. Uh, so in this study, left eye uh, was recovered based on our old traditional method, and then the right eye was implemented for double soak procedure. Uh, so when it comes to eye banking operations and recovering donor tissue, uh, generally before procuring any uh, ocular tissue, we perform for next swift uh, using 5% uh, povidone iodine solution. Uh, then after that, lid margin uh, procedure is performed. And then directly 1.5 ml of betadine is added onto the eye. Uh, we wait five minutes before uh, performing eye irrigation, and after that, conjunctiva is removed. Uh, before, we would remove the conjunct, after conjunctival removal, we will pr proceed with corneal excision, uh, but with our new procedure, after removing conjunctiva, now we are adding additional 1.5 ml of betadine directly uh, onto the ocular surface, and then wait another five minutes and perform second eye irrigation, and then proceed with corneal excision. Uh, so for this research study, we uh, had side-by-side -side comparison with single and double beta dyne procedure. After that was done, tissues were sent to the research lab, at our research lab, where, where a research technician who was blinded for the treatment group uh, label all these donor corneas with calcium AM as marked uh, by green dye here, uh, which is an indicator of live cells. And we also uh, mark these corneas with propidium iodide, uh, which is a marker for dead cells. And you can see here uh, this image from uh, like a, a fluorescence microscope showing a green live cell and red dead cells from a corneal epithelial surface. So we perform, as I mentioned, we procured left eye after single beta dyne soap procedure and then right eye after double beta dyne soap procedure. So on the corneal surface, we took images at central cornea, peripheral cornea, and around the limbus. Uh, and as I mentioned, they, are, they were marked with calcium AM for live cells and propidium iodide uh, for dead cells. And I hope you can appreciate that between left and right eye, we didn't see uh, much differences for the density of these different live versus dead cells. Uh, we went ahead and uh, measured number of uh, cells, different dead and live cells in these uh, images from seven different donors, uh, which was done as a paired analysis. Uh, so on this graph, uh, this is a simplified data representation showing uh, what percentage of epithelial cells were dead after this procedure and after undergoing the fluorescent staining uh, protocol. Uh, so the bars on left side uh, highlighted in blue are from single beta dyne soap procedure and the right side bars are from double beta dyne soap procedure. And you can see uh, through our hands, we see approximately 40%, 40 to 50% epithelial cell loss uh, after this experimentation. And there were not really any significant difference between uh, left and right eye, indicating that uh, increasing beta dyne exposure uh, doesn't really cause any additional epithelial toxicity. So we also wanted to uh, analyze our uh, clinical data retrospectively. Uh, 
So as I mentioned, we started double beta dinosaur procedure on November 1st, uh, 2019. So we looked at data for three months after starting this procedure. And then uh, from August to October, 2019, three months before that. Uh, so between these three months time period, we had about uh, 2,800 uh, ocular uh, donor tissue recovered during this time period. Uh, so for all these 2,800 eyes in each group, uh, after the recovery, uh, very well-trained uh, eye bank technicians perform specular microscopy to assess the epithelial uh, epithelial morphology. And then based on the severity of exposure, we grade each tissue uh, on the scale of zero to three, uh, zero being no uh, severity on exposure versus three being most severe. Uh, so we observe mean our average uh, severity of exposure for the pre or before about 1.48. And after implementing double beta dinosaur procedure uh, for these close to 3000 eyes, it was still 1.48. So somewhere between mild to moderate, nothing severe. And there were, wasn't any significant difference between before and after. Uh, we also measure a uh, total number of tissues with epithelial defects. So before we were having about 27% of tissue with any sort of epithelial defect. Uh, and after implementing, we actually also have just 26% of tissue. So again, no statistically significant difference before and after implementing the procedure. Uh, and then defect area restricted to about just under 6% uh, for our before and after group. So again, indicating not not a huge area that has any defect, but again, the numbers didn't change before or after, indicating that uh, on our all on our clinical cases, we didn't see any negative effect of increasing beta dyne soap time. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, there was some concern uh, or there has been literature in animal models showing beta dyne directly causes endothelial cell toxicity. Obviously, on the donor tissue, we are uh, doing it superficially, so there are less chances of beta dyne actually uh, sipping into the anterior side. Uh, but you can see uh, there wasn't any much difference between endothelial cell density. So pre-double uh, beta dyne soap procedure, our average cell density used to be around 2,500. And before uh, implementing this procedure, we are still in the same range uh, without any statistical significant differences. And then pre-lamellar thickness on our, all of our DSEC tissues, a good indication of how overall corneal health may be affecting. And you can see uh, before it was uh, average pre-lamellar thickness was four, 522 micron and after that it's 520. So pretty comparable data before and after. And this is just a representative image from our uh, research study that we did. Uh, so here we are looking at endothelial cells stained with calcium AM, which are live cells and a few red dots uh, you can see in between. Those are from uh, dead cells onto the endothelial side. And you can appreciate that there is not much difference on the endothelial cell density for live cells between uh, single soak versus double soak. Uh, so next question we wanted to ask how it's actually affecting our uh, post uh, positive rim culture data. Uh, so after we provide tissue to our surgeons, they uh, send the cultures out and we get the report back about how many of those tissues came positive. Uh, so here on uh, x-axis, I have data from starting from December 2018 to October 2019, nine months period. So that is before uh, implementing double beta dyne soap procedure. And then the data point highlighted after or from November 2019 in orange uh, bar uh, dots here are after implementing the double soap procedure. And I, I hope you can appreciate that our overall positive rim culture rate has gone down uh, significantly after implementing uh, this additional beta dyne soap procedure. Uh, and obviously there is a COVID-19 pandemic uh, has taken uh, effect here. So our numbers could be affected by that. But again, this is a percentage number. So all the data points were normalized for how many surgical tissue we provided. Uh, so just to simplify this data a little bit more, uh, how, what we did, we club all the data points together from December 2018 to October 2019. 
where we had average uh, positive rim culture rate around 1.2%, similar to what has been reported by uh, previous studies as well as CPTS work. Uh, but since November 2019, our positive rim culture rate has dropped down somewhere close to 0.4%. And then this difference uh, is very significant. Uh, so going forward, we are going to continue evaluating this. Obviously, we need more data points uh, to see how the long-term uh, numbers are for positive rim culture rate are affected by double beta dinosaur procedure. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, I would like to highlight that we have not uh, received any post-operative infection being re <clears throat> reported to us uh, after November 2019, which is which is a great point. Uh, so with that, just to summarize what uh, our data shows that increasing beta dyne exposure does not cause any additional uh, epithelial or endothelial toxicity or overall corneal toxicity. And it seems like it appears to decrease the incidences of corneal rim contamination. Uh, so that's pretty much from my side. Thank you so much for listening. I, I will pass this back to Michelle. Great, thank you. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, if anyone does have a question, you can type it into the Q&A panel and Dr. Dasjerdi or Dr. Savant will answer your question. Okay, it looks like we have a question for Ankar in regards to the double Povo iodine rinse, do you know how it compares to what other eye banks are doing? Um, thank you for that question. So I don't have a complete answer. I know uh, EBA does recommend this procedure. Uh, as I mentioned uh, during my presentation, uh, I know Georgia Eye Bank uh, does implement this procedure. Uh, so right now, I think since we, I think we were one of the earlier adapt, early adapter for this. Um, so November 2019 is when we started. I think there are a couple more eye bank that has started implementing this procedure. It just I don't have the exact information with me. Okay, uh, we have a question from Dr. Jalaj. How soon after an initial stromal keratitis episode with scarring will you wait to perform a PKP? Um, this is a real, really a difficult question. Uh, you know, uh, as much as I know, uh, nobody can um, really know, but some suggestion as if one year uh, patients is free episodes, free of any recurrent episodes, we can consider doing um, surgery. Uh, that's at least one year that I heard, but uh, there is no study. Actually, I looked for this uh, multiple times to find out, but I couldn't find a very definitive uh, answer to this. But this is something that anecdotally, uh, and uh, I heard from many uh, other corneal surgeons that they wanted to wait at least one year before they do the surgery. At least one year, uh, patient without any uh, recurrent episode. So it looks like uh, that will end our webinar. I'd like to thank everyone again for joining us this evening. The webinar has been recorded and will be available on our website to view on demand if you'd like to go back and view it. A very special thank you to Dr. Desjardi and Dr. Savant for serving as today's speakers and providing us with your invaluable expertise on these subjects. I hope everyone has a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.